owns most of us. That's a good idea. And an ardent CI member, an ex-committee member, and uh, a, a legend in among cruising sailors. His weather talks and WhatsApp channel is also legendary. Um, and as the go-to person for weather for our CAI cruises over the years, he is extremely helpful and a great teacher. Uh, tonight's presentation is being recorded and it's well worth viewing again for those who can't or for those who can't be here tonight. So, John, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. It's exactly just coming on time now. And uh, I'd like to welcome everybody who's come from various different clubs. We're not all... We're not all CAI tonight, I know that. There are people from other clubs as well. And it's lovely to have that. And uh, if you look at the chat, you'll find there's a link there to the um, to the weather group um, on WhatsApp. And it's a very lively group. And um, so tonight I'm going to talk to you about Irish weather. And uh, our weather is unique um, pretty much in the world. I can't think anywhere else that gets weather like we do. Um, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing because we have a thing called water called rain and that's going to be the most valuable commodity on the planet in the next 30 or 40 years so we're very lucky to live in Ireland and we got to go to, we better start to love the rain rather than hating the rain which is how I was brought up you know but um anyway tonight we'll talk about um we'll talk about uh, can everybody see the screen okay there I just want to make sure we're on we're on message there okay so tonight we'll talk about the weather obviously synoptic charts which are the ones with the squiggly lines on them Causes of weather, the major climatic zones. We live pretty much between several. We live in the battlefield between the climatic zones. <clears throat> we look at depressions, which are the ones we know and love. Low pressure systems, which bring us the miserable weather. Synoptic charts, <clears throat> um, they're the ones I mentioned a moment ago, which are ones with the squiggly lines on them. And um, a little bit about the internet. And um, so, so. What is weather then? So weather is, sounds like a bit of a silly question, but we did this one in aeronautical school. Weather isn't the sun shining. Uh, weather is anything, it's anything that's not the sun shining, if you like. It's, it's whenever there's something in the sky that isn't the sun. So the, the weather in, in the Sahara Desert might be hot, but it's not weather. It's just, weather is, is, is precipitation, it's rain, it's fog, it's it's all those things. It's gales of wind. It's things that affect you. So, um, give me a second. So we have wind, rain, cloud, fog, snow, hail, precipitation. We call all those. Sunny is not actually weather, but I think we often we often refer to our lovely sunny day. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's just technically, it's not weather. And uh, a world without weather. Well, there's the Earth as it could be. Just a flat, a kind of a, a it could be that shape, no reason why it's not, and that could be the sun. No water, no air, and it would have no weather. Just nothing, right? But we're not like that a bit, are we? Um, we have a few more things. And to make weather, we need, just like to make a cake, you need ingredients. And I wonder if anybody think what the ingredients are before I throw up the next slide. Um, what sort of ingredients might, have to think, would create weather? And... Uh, I'll put them up one by one, but try and think of them before they pop up. Things you think without which there would be no weather. Well, the first one really is the sea and, and lakes. Uh, without the sea, there'd be no water vapor and there'd be no rain and there'd be no, 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 there'd be not, no clouds and the world would be a very different place. It'd be like that place I showed you a moment ago. Um, the globe, uh, vast temperature differences between the, the North Pole and the equator. That wouldn't happen if the world was flat. It would all be one temperature. The Coriolis spin, now I did put up a thing on the Weather Channel earlier, it's asking people to have a look at the Coriolis effect, but uh, I'll talk about it in a minute. Coriolis is what causes the, the wind to, to, to go in a circular motion, anti-clockwise in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. Everything in the, in the Northern Hemisphere that's free to move from a rifle bullet to, a, to an artillery shell, to the wind, is deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. And then you have the, the air and the wind, of course. Without the air, there'd be no weather at all, because there'd be nowhere, the weather couldn't move around without the air. And the wind, vertical wind is, of course, clouds, and horizontal is what we call wind. And then the probably the biggest one is the sun, because even if you had all the others, 
if you didn't have the suns heated all up, we'd have no weather at all because everything would be the same temperature. And then the biggest one for us in Ireland is the land sea interface. We're living on the edge of the Atlantic on the one side and Europe on the other. We have the Sahara only a thousand kilometers to the south and we have the Greenland a thousand kilometers to the north with a temperature difference of 120 degrees. Astonishingly vast range in a very short space. So those are the things I just, this is a list, but look at, look at these four diagrams. Well, there's your oceans, land sea interface. Notice the amount of land, notice the amount of sea. And wherever, you, wherever they join, you're gonna get bad weather. You, you're sorry, you're gonna get weather because the temperature of the sea is always very different from the temperature of the land. And not only throughout the year, but throughout the day. Um, so the other thing about the ocean is it creates water vapor. So you're looking at this picture here, which you can see here to the right, the one there, the beach. Well, you've got the wind blowing, that's part of the weather, and you've got the moisture rising, forming cloud, which then comes down as rain. On the left bottom, you've got the earth, uh, which is a globe. And it's not flat, is it? It's, 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 it's a globe and it spins. And it spins from left to right towards the east. And um, that's the vertical axis there, you can see. And we all know that the top of it is very, very, very cold. And at the equator, it's very, very, very hot. And then finally, we have our sun, which is on the bottom right hand. So they have kind of a pictorial version of, of that. And uh, those, are the, those are the main factors that create our weather. But in Ireland, if you look at where we sit in, up at the top here, we sit really so much on the edge of all that stuff. And uh, it creates our extremely variable weather. There's one other thing I haven't mentioned here, of course, the Gulf Stream, which comes up from the uh, Gulf of Mexico and keeps us ice free in the winter without which we would be frozen to death. I don't know if you can see that top left picture, but we are, we are about the same level as Hudson Bay um, in terms of latitude. Uh, we're at the same level as the Gobi Desert in Asia. Where, so we lie at a part of the planet which is frozen for most of the winter, and, uh, and yet we're not. So now that is, um, that's actually the weekend just gone by and on the top left, we have a synoptic chart, which you won't probably understand very much at the moment, but we'll talk about them. And then, but you can see that England is pretty much in the clear on that synoptic chart. There's, there's a lot, not, not much going on in terms of wiggly lines. It says 1032 there, which means 1032 millibars, which is quite high pressure. And then you've got two nasty things over Ireland, but that always means bad weather. And then if you look at the, this particular image here, this is what it looks like for real. And as you can see, it's pouring the rain in Ireland and over in England, there's no rain at all. And then if you look at the actual satellite image, you can see that England's covered in ice and snow, which it was that day. It was actually, I think, last Saturday. It was a minus one in England and you can see it there very clearly. It's quite cold. And over where we are, if you can see it, it's green underneath. It's because we weren't quite so cold and it was raining. And you can see the cloud over Ireland. So that's a synoptic chart top left. Uh, bottom left, you have an interpretation of that chart by somebody called Mr. Windy. Now, Ireland has all the ingredients that we talked about earlier. Um, if you're making a cake, if you only have one or two ingredients, it's a boring old cake. If you have a lot of ingredients, you get a very nice cake, a very varied kind of cake. And that's what we have. First thing to come to here then is why is the North Pole cold? And it might, and the equator so hot. And this is the fact that governs very much of our weather in Ireland. And you might think, well, of course the cold North Pole's cold. Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> because the sun is very weak up there. Actually, the strength of the sun at the North Pole is identical to the strength of the sun at the equator. Except it's not, for a reason we'll see now. So in space, if you're out in space, the sun's energy is two kilowatts per square meter. Uh, that would be just about 12 miles up in the sky, 15, 20 miles up. You know, if you had a, a two bar electric fire and you attach it to a, a solar panel of one square meter, you could run your electric fire. Right. That's a lot of energy. That's a lot of energy. It's, it's, it's amazing. And it's come all the way 93 million miles to reach us. So um, but by the time it reaches the ground, the best we can do with it uh, is put up a solar panel and all of your two kilowatts. If you can get 350 watts per square meter, you're doing well. <clears throat> so 
That's caused by a lot of factors like obviously the uh, cloud, uh, water vapor, the amount of atmosphere, and um, also that solar panels aren't that efficient. But they, they do quite well, 350 watts per square meter is what I have on my roof. Now, the first thing people don't get about the atmosphere, and that's why we pollute it so badly, <clears throat> is how thin it actually is. If you take a school globe, a uh, school globe like the one you remember from school, about, what, two feet across, if you were to put a coat of varnish on that, that is the thickness of the atmosphere. And in fact, you can see it in that very good image there. The atmosphere is only as thin as that little tiny band at the top. It's about a millimetre on that, on that diagram. We have no air at all. We're just this little tiny veneer of air covering the, the globe. And you can look at that another way. The, the, the diameter of the Earth is uh, 12,000 miles. And the depth of the air is about eight miles. So you can see it's, it's tiny. And that's <laughs> why what we're doing it to is, is, not, is not, um, it's not something we can keep doing because we're just dumping stuff into this very thin layer. But anyway, so now why is it cold at the North Pole? Well, if you take a ray of sunshine at the equator, it covers, let's call it one square meter. And let's call that two kilowatts. And it, it hits the equator at there. By the time it gets to the North Pole or even up to 60 degrees where we live, the same ray of, the same ray of sunshine is now being diluted by the angle. In other words, it's striking a much larger portion of the Earth's surface. So it's diluted by, ge by, by, by geometry, not by air, not by water vapor, just by the geometry. And by the time it gets to the North Pole, it becomes zero. And you can see it in that picture very well. There's the incoming sunlight on the, on the um, right. And each of those sunbeams, as you can see on the equator, strikes, let's call it one square meter. But by the time it comes near the North Pole, that same sunbeam coming in is actually striking a huge area because it's coming in at an angle. And by the time it gets to the top of the picture, there is zero, zero impact. Unless, of course, you were to stand upright and face the sun. I'll show you that now. So here's a guy at the equator and he's getting the full sunbeam and he's nice and warm. Get him up to the North Pole. And as you can see, the sunbeam is the same, but by the time it hits the atmosphere, it becomes diluted by the atmosphere. <coughs> and it also becomes diluted by the angle. So there are two, two aspects that are reducing the sun's impact. One would be the, the angle is much less and of course, the other one being that it's having to go through miles and miles and miles of damp atmosphere. And actually at the North Pole, the strength of the sun is only about 10%, uh, assuming you're on the surface of the planet. If you're out in space, and I'll give an example here, you can see quite clearly there's a, there's a, just give me a second. You can see a two bar electric fire there, and you can see that uh, it's got a solar panel attached to it. And you can see it's creating two kilowatts because both the bars are on here. Yeah? And that, that's at the equator. If you were then to, uh, that's in space. If you then move that, um, come on baby. And then you move that down to the, uh, the surface of the equator and it's down to one kilowatt because of the, the atmosphere is robbing the energy from the sun. And then if you put it at the North Pole, zero watts because the panel is now lying on its side and it has no power at all. So those, those are the reasons why the pole is so cold. It doesn't make it, it's not obvious to everybody why it is, but it is. So that has a huge effect, of course, on us, because we're not far from the North Pole here. If it wasn't for the Gulf Stream, we would now be at minus 30. Now, clouds are very important to us in Ireland and every, everywhere, really, in, and increasingly so as we, as we run short of water. But what is a cloud and what causes a cloud? Not sure where that's coming from. Give me a moment. So this is a little image I'd like to show. It's if you were at um, a cocktail party in the summertime and somebody's having white wine and they're wearing white trousers or a white dress, you might notice that water is dribbling all over their dress or their trousers and it looks a bit embarrassing. Well, the reason is that the water vapor in the atmosphere is uh, condensing on the on the cold wine and running down the glass and onto your trousers. And then you have to say, oh, it's my wine glass. And uh, 
And that's the effect that, that cold has on the water vapor in the atmosphere. The moment it drops below its what we call its dew point, the all the all the all the uh, moisture in the atmosphere converts itself into water or water vapor or cloud or fog. So I'm not quite sure why it's doing that. Yeah. So dew point is the temperature at which, if you will, if reduce the temperature of the air to to its dew point, the relative humidity becomes 100 percent. And we have the white wine, which it looks like the picture, and you have the red wine, which is perfectly all right. And that's why. So what causes air to cool to the dew point? Now, there are loads of things that can do this. But when they do, when air cools to the dew point, you get precipitation. What we called earlier on, uh, cloud, rain, fog, you name it. It's the stuff we don't like, but actually we're going to have to come to love one day. So what can cause air to cool to the dew point? Well. So it's a nice day, it's 14 degrees, uh, but it's a nice sunny day. There's no cloud in the sky, nothing at all. What will cause the air to cool? Fall in temperature. And the reason the temperature can fall is for many reasons, and here they are. First of all, as you go up in the sky, the air cools by two degrees per thousand feet. Um, that's just a fact. And by the time you get to cruising altitude of an aeroplane, it's minus 50. And that is a law of, that's a, an axiom. That is a law of physics, every two degrees per thousand feet. So if you go up, even if you go up to the top of the sugar loaf, you're three degrees cooler straight away, which is why you often see cloud on top of the sugar loaf or on top of Hoth or on top of uh, Bray Head or on top of the Table Mountain in uh, Cape Town. Low pressure. Well, low pressure air rises because it's lighter. So up she goes and you're gonna get clouds. Fronts, we'll talk about those in a minute, but the front is where warm air meets cool air. And the warm air being lighter climbs up on top of the cool air and, it, and in climbing up, it gets cooler at two degrees per thousand feet. Hills, and we all know what Hoth looks like on a, on, a, on, a, on a nice sunny day with a bit of a, a southwester, sorry, a, a southerly wind. And next thing you can't see Hoth at all, it's gone. And it's because of, the air rising over hose and cooling by two degrees and enough to form it, form fog, hill fog. Heat, funny enough, can create, can create a cloud. You think, well, the heat's going to burn off the cloud. It'll burn it, you know, it'll be, the, but no. If anybody's been to Singapore where it's 35 degrees every day of the year, it's the cloudiest place on earth because the heat causes the air to rise. And as the air rises, it's, it climbs up into the sky and of course, it gets cooler and it creates thunderstorms. And we all are familiar with the tropics, anybody who's ever been down there. And nightfall, of course, is when the uh, clouds all disappear and the radiated heat of the Earth radiates back into space, creating a big drop in temperature, most noticeably causing fog at night. So there you are. And that's all caused by air dropping to its dew point. The dew point being the temperature at which it will condense into visible moisture. Now, fog is simply cloud at ground level. And fog is at nighttime, clear skies, no wind, and the, the temperature drops like a stone and the air falls to its dew point. Or, this is one we get in Ireland a lot, you get warm moist air coming up off the Bay of Biscay, being carried up a southwester, and it comes up over our cold sea, and the cold sea causes the wind to drop in temperature. And then you get one of the nastiest fogs of all called advection fog, because it's being carried by the wind and it doesn't blow away when the wind blows, it, it actually makes it worse. So you can get a, a lot of fog at sea uh, in a 4-7, which is very, very nasty indeed. The other kind of fog up above always disappears when the sun comes up. So there's two different types of fog. But again, I'm getting this idea of the, the, the air, which is always full of moisture, is cooled to its dew point. Now, we're coming down to cloud names, and they all have names. And again, this is, I said earlier on, is this is a glancing blow of weather. We're going to cover a lot of topics tonight. And this is just to show you that the names of clouds, which often you'll hear on Meta Aaron, you often hear them talking about the different names, but they're actually all Latin words, but they... They're really all a combination of Latin words, as you'll see in a minute. So first of all, 
height. So Cirrus is high cloud. It's the one that's 8, 15 miles up. Usually very, very high. You can hardly see it. It's very thin and wispy. Alto is high cloud about 15,000 feet, three or four miles up, you can, usually on a nice sunny day. And then you get low level clouds, which don't have a prefix. They're just called cloud, all right? We'll come to that now. But you can mix up those three words, Ciro, Alto, with other words. So for example, there we have them all. So we have um, taking up the cirrus clouds at the top, Ciro cumulus, puffy clouds, cirrus stratus, stratus being the Latin word for layer. And then cirrus is just wispy clouds. Then you have your mid-layer clouds, your altos, alto cumulus, alto stratus. Again, they're just a mixture of the, the same Latin words. Cumulo nimbus. Yeah, nimbus is the Latin word for rain. Cumulo means cumuli, well, piling up in Latin. So cumulo nimbus is a thunderstorm. A cumulus is, a, is what we call a fair weather cloud in the summer. Strata cumulus is a cumulus which is laid out. It's not completely covering the sky. It's more of a layer. And then we get the stratus, which we associate with bad weather. And the worst one we get here in Ireland, the one I was talking to earlier, the one I remember from my child, the nimbo stratus, where it's gray and miserable, uh, Connemara weather, you know what I mean? It's just that gray drizzle that never seems to stop. But you can see that actually there aren't too many words there. They're all combinations of the same three, four words. So there's your fair weather cumulus, buffy white clouds. There's a cumulo nimbus. Incidentally, that cloud in the front is a cumulus cloud. The one in the middle is a, a, a towering cumulus, probably up to 12, no, seven miles. The one in the background goes up to 50,000 feet and it has a flat top. And the reason it has a flat top is it's reached the troposphere. It's reached the point where there's no more air and it can't go any higher. And that's why you can always tell when a, when a cumulus nimbus has reached the top of the atmosphere uh, the, above that, above that, uh, there is no more cloud because there's no air. So that's uh, that's a cumulative number. Stratus, uh -huh. the one I love from my childhood. Stratus, medium clouds. Just carrying on here. We've done those, and that's what alto cumulus looks like. It's cumulus about I don't know five miles up. You know, summer's day, sun shining through it. Not too bad at all. Just another type of cloud. And then the, the high clouds that we know, cirrus clouds, I'm just going to show you what they look like. And there they are. And on that picture, you have a picture of several types of cirrus cloud, cirrus stratus, cirrus cumulus, and a jet, <laughs> a jet airplane creating its own little cirrus cloud going across the top of the screen. So clouds, just so that in case they, just so you get to love them more, they all have names, but they're all mixtures of Latin words, and there aren't that many, and you can learn them very easily. Now, there we have, um, that would be Cerro Cumulus, probably about eight, 10 miles up. Um, very, very high, and it's, as you can see, it's uh, Cumulus. It's puffy, very high up. Now, Coriolis is what we were talked about earlier. I did advise people to, to look at a little video I sent out earlier, and it means that any free moving object in the Northern Hemisphere will be deflected to the right. Thus, the winds produced by pressure gradients do not flow directly from high to low pressure, but they curve to the right. And um, I'll show you that now in a diagram. So if you take the equator as being hot, which it is, and the where we live being cold, which it is, the air will flow from the equator towards us in a northerly direction, just like that. And the isobars, which are lines of equal pressure, they run from left to right. So each of those lines is a line of equal pressure. So high pressure at the equator, and then you have the low pressure. And, the, and you can see the air is naturally going to flow straight up the screen towards the low pressure, but it doesn't. It is deflected to the right by Coriolis. So it actually ends up blowing parallel to the isobars, not at right angles. So whenever the wind blows in the Northern Hemisphere, it's deflected to the right. And if you don't know that, it's very important to know that because that's, that governs pretty much everything that comes afterwards today, this evening. So here we have an example of a low pressure system where the air is rising. We, we'll come to that in a minute as to why it does that, but it's rising in the middle. Um, we're looking at it from the top and we can see that the air is being dragged in from the bottom in towards the low pressure. And, and initially it goes straight towards the low pressure, but as it comes closer, it starts being deflected 
And the next thing, it starts going round the low pressure, just like when you pull the plug out of your sink and down it goes. And it goes down, as you know, in your sink in a circular motion. It doesn't go down straight. And that's exactly what happens with air. So air does not flow from high to low pressure in a straight line. It goes in a kind of a, a circular cyclonic um, manner. And that's very important. So in the Northern Hemisphere, where you have low pressure, the air flows anti-clockwise. There's another way of looking at it. The blue lines are the air coming in, um, and, and the black lines show how that air is deflected into a spiral around the low pressure system. And in the middle of that low pressure system, the air is rising up towards your face. It's coming out of the screen. It's, it's rising up into, into the upper altitudes. So that's looking down at sea level from on top. It's a plan view. OK, and the air is rising upwards in the middle of all that. Now, there's an example of a low that we would see on a synoptic chart. And it's exactly like the one I showed you there, except I've added in two more things, which are the fronts. Now, you might say, well, what, what are they doing there? Well, what, why is there a front? Well, I mean, what, what's that little red thing doing there? And what's the black one doing? Well, conventionally, we show a warm front as being uh, red um, semicircles and black triangles. And um, I used to, res when, I, when I was teaching this a long time ago, I used to say Marilyn Monroe and, and Madonna. But anyway, you get the idea. The warm front and the, and, the, and, the, and the spiky front on the left. But the warm front is the one on the right, right? Now, the, the, it's the front of the warm air. The warm air lives in this triangle beneath, between the two fronts. Because you may remember earlier on that the, the air to the north of uh, the pole, sorry, the north of, of the planet is cold. And the air to the bottom is warm. But once it starts circulating around a low, it loses its identity, but not completely. The, the wedge between the cold and the warm front always retain the warm wind. So within this triangle here, I'm showing you with my, my pointer, that is where you have warm, what is, what is remains of the warm wind. The rest of it's pretty cold. Okay, now that's what it looks like, a typical front crossing Ireland. Um, now, this comes up a lot. So what is a ridge? Well, there are two low pressure systems, one on the left, one on the right, and the air goes anti-clockwise around each of them. Okay, we're happy with that, it goes anti-clockwise. Round a high, the, the air goes the other way around. Okay, it goes clockwise round a high. And sometimes between lows, you, get a, you, you will get a ridge of high pressure, which is separating the two lows. These are the little lads that give us our good weather in Ireland. Whenever you see a ridge coming over Ireland, you're in for about eight hours of good weather. The, the low could be atrocious. The next low could be atrocious. But within, when you have a ridge bulging in like that, it's a bulge of good weather. The best known high we have is the Azores high, which is the one at the bottom. There's also a high up in the polar regions. But the one we know and love is the Azores high. That's the one that gives us the good weather in Las Palmas and the Canary Islands. But bear in mind, between each low pressure system, there's nearly always a ridge of high pressure. Now, next weekend, here is the lovely ridge. And this is real. This is taken from this morning. And what you can see there is the Azores High down here near the Azores is bulging up towards Ireland. And it's pushing up between the low pressure on the left and low pressure over Spain down here where there's bad weather. And it's giving us a remarkably nice weekend next weekend. That's why I keep saying to people, look out for your ridges. The ridge is your, is your window of opportunity. And it's, it's exactly what's happening there. But you can see it's, this is a real one. And this is next weekend. And sometimes they can last for an hour or two, maybe five hours. Sometimes it can last for a day. This one looks like lasting not only next weekend, but a week today, which is Wednesday week, today week. See, we have another ridge of high pressure. So we have high pressure in the, in the Bay of Biscay, which is always good weather. And you can see it's bulging up as far as Dublin, no problem. And way above Dublin, up in Donegal, it's low pressure, nasty weather. Down in, um, down in um, Sardinia and Italy, very bad weather. But the, notice that the high is between the two lows. That's the point. And that's where you'll find your little breaks or, or your big breaks. You know, that's a big one. So. 
on the 16th of December, I was putting this out. I was saying to lads on, on the 16th of December, get out there. It's a lovely day because there's a horrible depression coming across the Atlantic. Now, let's look at this synoptic chart. This is the BBC or the Met Office, UK Met Office, every day in colour. And it goes out five days. And I could see by looking at this that on Monday, the 16th of January, we were in for a really nice sort of weather. Because if you look at where Kerry is, you can see there's a ridge of high coming right up into Scotland. And the isobars are a long way apart. That means very light winds. The tighter the isobars, if, if you look over here towards where I'm, I'm pointing now, the, the very, very strong winds. Down around the Azores, very light winds. But you can see that we're in, for, and actually a lot of people went out sailing that day and they rang up that evening and said, wow, John, that was brilliant. I got my ridge, thanks, thanks for the ridge. And it's these ridges, you really need to look out for them. And you won't see them on a normal weather forecast so much. You'll see them on this though. You'll see them on your synoptic chart. And then if you were to look at say Met Aaron, you'll find that Met Aaron is saying, oh, and um, Monday on the 16th of January, there will be a break in the weather of about seven hours, but, that, but you will know why. You'll know why, and that's the point. Now, what's all this then, this high and low pressure? Right. This is kind of into climatology, but it's very important because we live, we live in a part of the, of the planet which is quite unique. So if you take the equator, which we know to be very hot, the air rises over the equator. And I, 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 can you see my little pointer? I hope you can. Oh, by the way, um, John or Pat, if you pop in, if you can't hear me, because I have no feedback, you see, that, 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 I, that I can be heard. So if you just say... Yes, John, you're good. And we okay. would like to know. Yeah, I've got, I get no feedback that I can... <laughs> I might have been talking to myself for the last 20 minutes. Yeah, so anyway, take the equator, which we know to be very hot, right? The Sahara Desert. Line. The air rises, and it rises up to the hits the troposphere, which is what, where there's no air. And it travels north. It has no choice. It also travels south. It travels north and it reaches 30 degrees north. And what happens at 30 degrees north? It's that all the world's deserts are at 30 degrees north, including the Canary Islands. And so the air falls down to a, back down to ground level. And you can see it here where I'm showing you now on the right hand side. Up she goes at the equator, up she goes and falls down across that level. Now, falling air is high pressure. High pressure brings good weather. High pressure equals good weather. And so now when the air hits the ground at, at the equator, at, at, the, at the Sahara Desert, it has only two things it can do. It can, it can travel north or it can travel south. Well, it does both. So it travels north towards Ireland as the southwest trades. And it travels back towards the equator as the northeast trades. Now, notice it doesn't travel back in a straight line. It's deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. So we see that the southeast, the ones that the, the, the trade winds around Africa there, they are flood, they're actually not southern northerly winds, they're northeasterlies. And the winds we have in Ireland are southwesterlies. That's because of Coriolis, all right? So that's the that's the flow that creates our deserts. It's also the air, same air that originates in Singapore and all the way across Africa at the equator in Lagos, it goes up into the atmosphere, flows north, hits the, hits the equator. No, it doesn't, it hits the Sahara Desert, <laughs> flows north towards us and south back to the equator, creating what we call a cell. And we live in the southwest cities, the prevailing west cities. That's where we live. The trade winds we're familiar with are the Northeast trades, Canaries to the Caribbean, the Roaring Forties and the Southern Ocean and the southeast trades, which bring you from Cape Town to Brazil. The, these trade winds flow all year round, sometimes not so strong, sometimes stronger. Now, the other big thing we talked about earlier on was the cold North Pole and the, and the hot equator, the polar front. Ireland lies between the frozen north and the tropical south. We also lie between the ocean on the west and the continent on the east. And it is these four influences which govern our weather. So let's have a look at that. Um, and the most important of these things is the polar front. The polar front lies right across Ireland. Now, typically, 
this is not winter or summer it's just any time of the year but you've got your hot air over the sahara down on spain that's why we go on holidays there and we have greenland and iceland to the north and, and norway and then we have uh, the polar front and that polar front sits there all year long it don't, but it moves up and down dramatically and it's not a straight line either it, it weaves around and um that really governs what our summers and winters are going to be like last summer that red line that you can see there sat over athlone for three months if you were in belfast last july the temperature was eight degrees and it was cold if you were in cork last summer it was 15 degrees and quite pleasant and that went on from june and july until we got the heat wave in august and it was because that polar front was sitting literally right across ireland that is the effect it has on us and it means we either have good summers bad summers but good winters bad winters so that's probably one of the biggest variables that we face in ireland now what causes i didn't mention it here but the jet stream which brings our weather travels along the polar front now whatever the winds are doing down here zigging around or whatever they're doing makes no difference but whatever they're doing at at 20 miles up no 10 miles high in the sky you've always got the jet stream blowing and it's blowing at 200 miles an hour and it blows along the colder front and i'll explain why so air flows from warm to cold the equator has hot air the cold air has the north pole has cold air and it's not as dense it's, a, it's sorry it's very dense and at the equator the air is not dense it's very high so what happens is the air flows downhill from the equator to the north pole and in so doing it flows from south to north and as the air flows from south to north you end up with the jet stream now why does the jet stream then not flow north i bet you all know by now and why does it not flow why does it not flow uh, in a northern direction from the equator to the North Pole. Well, it's because of our friend Coriolis, isn't it? So what actually happens is that the air tries to go from the warm air to the cold air, but it's deflected to the right by 90 degrees by Coriolis, and it becomes a jet stream. And the jet stream flows over Ireland all year long. Sometimes it's north of us, and sometimes it's south of us. And that again is pretty much governs our weather. The jet stream is, if you like, a river that brings the weather that we experience. And when the jet stream is north of us, we get good weather. And when it's south of us, we get bad weather. And so this is the whole thing about Ireland. We live, we're living at the confluence of all these different um, factors. Now, what is this one? This is the 24th of January, 2023. I'm not quite sure what that's doing there, but it's quite a good one. Um, so if you just look at that, just as, as a synoptic chart. Um, well, I'll tell you what you can see on that straight away, right? So if you look at the where the low pressure systems are lying, they're lying over Newfoundland, over Iceland, and right up into Norway. And Ireland is living on the 24th of January this year, which is uh, today. Yes, today. That's what it is. I've just realized. That is today. And the jet stream is flowing right up over the north of, of Iceland today and up over Norway. And we're in a relatively, if you were out today, a lovely day. And, and that's what you've got. You've got the lovely high pressure system down here. And the jet stream is up here to the north. And it's bringing all those nasty uh, eddies, uh, low pressure systems, way up north over Norway. And that's a good example of the jet stream today. And, and what it's doing is giving us a nice day. And that high pressure system there is the air... Which, which originated at the Sahara. It didn't originate in the Sahara, it originated in the, at the equator. It landed at the Sahara, and now it's flowing north towards us, bringing us very fair, nice, reasonably uh, warm weather. And um, now that is uh, the 24th, that's the day. You can see the jet stream there, I just mentioned it to you, and you can see it's flowing up over Nova Scotia up over Greenland, up over Iceland, and missing UK completely, and up into Norway. And again, on the left here, you can see the weather today, the high pressure system, which is, and so all the bad weather is lying up here to the north. 
And that's the effect of the jet stream. In America, whenever you hear a forecast on the television or the radio, they always talk about the jet stream first. And the jet stream is lying over Minneapolis today, you know, and off they go, because they understand the jet stream. We never talk about it here. But it's funny enough, it's what makes our weather. And there is a good example of what I've just shown you, where the jet stream is dragging all the bad weather up over Norway, and the high pressure is dominating down here. And that, that, that blue arrow is at 200 miles an hour or 300 miles an hour. Now the lows don't travel at 300 miles an hour because they are at sea level. They travel at 30 miles an hour, about one tenth of the speed of the actual jet stream. So there are the influences we've looked at so far. We looked at the way that the, uh, the, jet, the polar front being the biggest one probably of all. I'll never forget last summer where I was in Belfast and we were wearing three layers of clothing on, in July. Um, and that was caused by the polar front lying over Athlone. Now, the other one that affects us greatly is this land-sea interface we talked about. And there are several types of wind that can come to Ireland. And there they are on the screen. And we also have, that's, that's temperature, right? So the next one is humidity. We can have dry air, warm air, moist air. We can have all kinds of maritime, would be our southwesters. And there they have it on a diagram. And depending on what direction the wind is coming from, you can see that summer or winter, depending on the season, and it says it there, for example, um, let's take the southwesterly one, Trop tropical maritime, warm, moist air over a cooler sea. That's, that's our southwest, the, the weather in West Cork that brings us that cloudy, kind of warm, drizzly weather. It's what Evelyn Cusack calls mild. Then we have our polar maritime air coming in off the North Atlantic, freezing cold, heavy rain showers, sleet. The Arctic weather we had recently, do you remember when it, we, we froze for about a week? And then you've got the dry air coming down off the, off the continent of Europe, which can make us very, very cold. The beast from the east was one of those. And then you've got, in summer, the really hot tropical air coming up off Africa and into Ireland. So you can see any of these is going to cause us to have very different weather. And moreover, they can all happen in one day. Um, now, that's not a very good picture. I'm not quite sure what it's doing there or that one. They're just good satellite images. Now, yes. so. We now come to the, the big beastie that affects Ireland the most, the, the, the low. So how does a low form? Well, you have, you have where we live, the southwesterly trades coming up from the southwest. We talked about those. We also have a northeasterly wind coming in all the time off the, off the North Pole, which we won't go into now, but you do. And it's always there. It, it, they, we, we live permanently and it, and it runs along the polar front. So we always have a kind of a northeasterly from up over Norway, and we have a southwesterly off Cork, and it causes a corkscrew motion like that. And what happens is you get a little bit of a low pressure system forming like that. Low pressure means that the air is blowing in towards the center of that circle. If it blows in towards the center, well, the air must rise. If the air rises, it must condense into cloud because it's rising into cool air. So you're getting a little mini low forming. So what will happen is, if you were out, say, in the middle of that sailing one day, you'd notice they got cloudy and you'd notice that the wind was now going around in a circle. Um, and if you looked at the weather chart, you'd, you'd see it on the weather chart. You'd see that. Now, the next day, there's your cold air to the north still. There's your warm air to the south. But the sea is now developing into a proper little bulge of warm air pushing up into the cold air. But notice it's starting to circulate. That's Coriolis. And as the air rises within that low, it, it creates its own energy for reasons we won't go into. And then the next day, you have what looks much more like a weather chart, this typical wedge of warm air with cold air to the north. And if you're in this warm air to the south here, it's still quite warm. If you're up in the cold air in the north, it's still quite cold. But the bad weather is going to be along the fronts. Now, a front is where the warm air meets the cold air. Now, in the left-hand image, it's not so obvious, but in the right-hand image, it's very obvious. And these words, fronts, they come from the First World War, where you had people entrenched. Uh, there weren't, it wasn't so much warm air and cold air as artillery shells, but 
that's where the Norwegians coined the term front from the First World War. It's the boundary between two opposing matters. And so they don't like to mix. The warm air and the cold air don't like to mix. And that's why they're called fronts. And we have them there, the fronts. Yeah, so good. And um, there's some air, warm air alongside some cold air, just for fun. Typically, that warm air would be on the equator and the, and the cold air would be to the north. But this just shows you what happens when they meet. They don't like to mix. And one of them pops up on top of the other like that. The warm air rises until eventually it creates a warm front. And that's what it looks like. But did you see the size of this thing? 300 miles from left to right. The cold air is now underneath the warm air and the warm air is rising up on top. As it's rising up to the right hand side of the picture, it's rising six miles right up into the troposphere where it's very, very cold, cirrus cloud. About 150 miles up uh, along the front, you're getting alto cumulus. And then on the left, you're getting nimbo stratus. That is a typical warm front caused by the warm air sloping up on top of the cold air. And this is what gives us our classical weather as we approach a weather system coming off the Atlantic. Now, here's a slightly better diagram of it, and it shows you a cross section through a warm front. So the figures are on the left, 10,000 kilometers, 10,000 meters high, and two or 300 miles along the horizontal scale. So it's heavily exaggerated. The slope of a warm front is about 1%, 2%, not 45%, like in that 45 degrees. So, but actually it's more like two or three percent or three degrees, but this is to show you what it looks like. If you were sailing along in Ireland and that front was out over the middle of the Atlantic, you'd be in nice warm, nice warm weather. As that front approaches you, you start to see puffy cumulus clouds appearing. And then about four hours later, you'd see strata cumulus cloud and you'd notice cirrus high up in the sky and you'd see cirrus stratus. And as that front gets closer to you, you notice the cloud getting thicker and thicker and eventually it would start to rain. And then as the front approaches you, you end your, your nimbo stratus, which is your heavy rain. And eventually at ground level, the front reaches you and it's pouring, absolutely pouring down. And that is what a front, a warm front looks like. And that's what it looks like, if you like, just in a diagrammatic form. But that, is, that shows you what it really looks like in terms of cloud formation, and the effect it has on you as a sailor. Now, the thing to note in this picture, by the way, is the distances we're talking about. That front could be 400 miles away. It could easily be 400 miles away. But the thing to remember is that the, weather, the bad weather extends east of the front by up to three or 400 miles east of the front. Once the front goes through, the weather improves dramatically. So there's your, there's your warm front. Now, once the warm front has gone through, you're now behind it, you have a cold front. <laughs> and cold front is the, where the warm air is now gone through and you're, you've got the cold air behind. And so this time the warm air climbs up on top of the cold air and it looks like this. So we've, we've had this rather nice weather for a little while. The warm front went away four hours ago. We've had a nice day, a nice afternoon, but suddenly, Thunderstorms start to appear and the wind is coming down from the northwest. And you can see that the angle of this um, front is quite steep. And a cold front isn't like a warm front. It isn't three or 400 miles wide. It's only 50 miles wide, 30 miles wide. It's a sharp, sharp shock. And that's why we know that when, a, when, a, when a, a cold front passes by Dublin Bay or Galway Bay, you're in for a, you're in for a hammering. Squalls, sleet, strong winds, winds from all over the place as the cumulonimbus cloud, the CB cumulonimbus cloud, dumps all its cold air on top of you, including all the rain and that lightning and everything else. So a cold front is a nasty beast, but very short lived. And that's what happens on a cold front, which is the one at the back of a depression. Uh, I think we're repeating ourselves there a little bit, but we know that low is anti-clockwise in the Northern Hemisphere. 
and around a high pressure, it's clockwise in the Northern Hemisphere. Now here we have a typical low. Now what you want to get out of this is this. There is a low pressure. Now let's look at this in some detail. 976 is the number of millibars, or they call them hectopascals nowadays, in honor of a French physician called Pascal. But actually, I use the imperial measure and call them millibars, which most people still do. Anyway, not to worry, that's a low pressure system. As you can see, the air goes anti-clockwise around it. The warm air to the south hasn't gone away, you know, like our dear friends, it's still there, but it's in a, it's in a wedge. Ahead of that warm front, right out across the UK, you have the bad weather. You have your, initially your cumulus clouds and your cirrus, right down to your nimbus. And as the front goes through Kerry, in this particular picture, Kerry will be getting the belting of the rain, the misery, the way you won't be able to come out of the pub. And then an hour later, you'll pop into the warm area here, the warm, the warm air, and the weather will improve. And you'll say, oh, that's a nice day. Let's go for sale. But what you haven't realized is right behind it, and we're talking about two hours later, the cold front with the Madonna pictures, that is where you're going to get the short, sharp shock. The other thing to note is the wind direction. Notice that the wind rotates anti-clockwise around this low. But you also have to notice that at the front, the wind changes direction quite dramatically at the front. It changes by about 40 degrees, actually, as the, as the front goes through. So it doesn't go gradually around. It just it changes dramatically as, as each front, particularly, funny enough, at the cold front. So we have, here we have it. So we are in Kerry. Uh, Dublin's, in, Dublin's getting, well, let's, let's say Collyhead. Not a bad old day in Hollyhead, bit of drizzle in, in Belfast. Not a bad old day in Dublin, but getting worse. Athlone pouring with rain. Kerry, really bad. Sudden improvement as we come through. Now, this low is moving, you may remember, at 30 knots. We mentioned that earlier. It moves at one tenth of the speed of the jet stream that carries it along. So it doesn't take that long to get from there to there. So about six hours later, Perry is going to be in, in heavy thunderstorms and the wind is going to go to the north. As if you notice on the back end of every low, the wind is for the north. And on the front end of every low, the wind is from the south. So let's just take the mariners of 50 years ago, which is roughly when I started saying, actually, if I was in the Irish Sea in this picture, with, in the absence of any shipping forecasts or the BBC or anything like that, what would I notice that tells, tells me that this horror is on the way? And there are three things would have told me. And, and well, anybody want to just pop their microphone off and say what they are? I'm, I'm, I'm at the Isle of Man and I notice this low is going to hit me in a few hours' time. What are the three things that will tell me that? Anybody, anybody want to open the mic and say? Keep it a bit interactive. Cirrus, the cirrus cloud. Cirrus cloud, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the first thing you notice will be the high cloud coming in and then lower, then alto cumulus. And then it, and the temperature would drop, of course, as the sun would go behind the cloud, it would get cooler. The biggest one, southerly wind. The wind is from the south. And so consequently, you just know whenever the wind is from the south, there's a low pressure to your left. Uh, the other thing would happen would be you have a, an instrument on your boat, which is very, very, not so, much, not so much these days, but they're still there. What's the instrument called? Pressure drop. The barometer, barometer. yeah. Your barometer is starting to fall like a stone. So the wind has gone to the south, the barometer is falling, the cloud is thickening, and it's getting drizzly. And the next thing is um, the temperature drops as well as the before the warm front arrives, because you're in cold air. Don't forget, it isn't until the warm front arrives that the warm air arrives. So you're still in cold air. So those four things will tell you. And if you if you were in a boat 50 years ago, that's how we used to do it. That's how we knew we were in for trouble. And if that happened, you was no doubt that you were in for a low. Then as the warm front hits you, it suddenly went all nice again. And you said, oh, we're, we're in this bit then. Now, you didn't know quite bit you were in, but you knew you were in this bit somewhere. But you knew that in about four hours, the wind would come from the northwest with a vengeance. And you get freezing cold thunderstorms. And it could get very unpleasant indeed. So that they, those were the things you could tell from. Now, there's a complete... The two fronts put together, on the right you have your warm front and your cirrus, cirrus stratus, altus stratus. 
in the middle you have your warm air your quite nice weather for a little break six hours and then you've got your thunderstorms and your cold freezing air coming in from the north at the back and um there we have um just a picture of the north atlantic if you look at low to the top nine six three millibars that's very very low just to give you some idea hurricane charlie was 960 so it just gives you some idea that one over there doesn't have a number on it but you can see the you can see the shape of the wedge there of the water that's the warm front down on the bottom we have our lovely high pressure over the azores which is a typical atlantic day in the north atlantic where is the polar front here right across the top okay where is the jet stream here right across the top and ireland is at the Ireland is at the mixing point here. You see, we're not quite out of trouble. We're, we're, we're catching the bottom end of everything. So, and you can see in Ireland there that the, 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 we're getting the northwesterly winds coming off the Atlantic. So, and the isobars are very close together. So just looking at that picture, I can tell you that that's 4-7 from the northwest and it's cold. You know, and I don't know what, even what season that is. But it wouldn't be a very pleasant day in Ireland that day. But it wouldn't be... It wouldn't be life threatening either. And if that little high pressure would pop up a bit higher, we'd have a nice day. So when we're looking at these synoptic charts, what we're looking for is the highs and the lows, the fronts. We can measure the closeness of the isobars and measure the speed of the wind of the low towards Ireland. And now, 1st of February 23. What's this one? Oh, yeah. So this is um, looking ahead, isn't it? Just looking ahead to the 1st of February. So what I just said to you, what we want to look at is where the highs and lows are, the closest of the isobars, and things like that. So the 1st of February is when? It's a week away, isn't it? Yeah, so this is next weekend, actually. Um, so what can I see? Well, I see quite a nice thing happening. I see that the Azores High is popping up towards Ireland there. Now, this is from the, a thing called the ECMWF, the European Centre for Match Forecasting. And it has a 10-day forecast, and it goes out as far as 10 days. Now, you can see over England, green is wet, and yellow is damp. So, and the island, as you can see in this picture, is still pretty much yellowish, dampy. So we're not out of trouble yet. But I reckon by the 2nd of February, that, that ridge of high pressure would have moved in. Now, let's see what else we can see on this, just for a bit of fun. If you wanted to cross the Bay of Biscay, would that be a nice day to do it? Well, there's a high pressure. Wind goes anti-clockwise anti around the high pressure, so you've got a nice northwester. The, the, the isobars are very far apart, so probably about 4-3. Excellent day to cross the Bay of Biscay next 1st February. Would you come up the English Channel? Well, the isobars are very close together. Love that green muck there. I don't like that very much. I think I might wait before I'd go anywhere. Um, looking down towards Cyprus, looks like very nice in Greece. It, so the ECMWF, it isn't a very detailed chart, but it does give you the, the big picture. The big picture. Now there is the same picture. I think that's the 1st of February as well. Yeah, it is. And it's the same picture from what we call windy.com which is another of our websites. And again, you can see uh, there's our high pressure coming up. There's all the storms sounding this channel. And you can see that northwesterly wind popping in there across Ireland. It's not too bad, six degrees. And again, just behind it, you can see that what's going to happen. We're going to get into this rather nice ridge. But that ridge is very short-lived. Right behind it is a dirty great front coming down the, the Atlantic. So... Every time I go looking at my weather forecast, I always look at windy first. I look at ECMWF and I look at the, the pressure patterns. Looking at the, by the way, down at Sardinia, you wouldn't want to be down there, would you? I mean, it really looks awful. And you don't need to be a weather forecaster to know that. You just have to know that that's pretty, pretty bad, you know, not very nice at all. Um, now we come to our more, we, we're going more into the internet now. and. Um, so what date is today? The 23rd. So Saturday this is next Saturday. Now next Saturday, I know there's some guys who want to go and do some training. So this is on what we call Predict Wind. Predict Wind is another one. And by the way, these will all be on a link, which I'm going to put on the screen. 
uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. And I'm also put on, on the chat the link to the WhatsApp group, which we call our weather channel. So all this stuff goes on every day on our weather channel. All I'm doing today is opening a window for you into this weather channel. So that's next Saturday. So what does it say? It says wind speed 12 knots, gust 17 in Dublin Bay. That's where the arrow is. So that looks to me like a pretty good day for a, a bit of a of, of training around Dublin Bay. Um, not too windy. It's an offshore wind. 17 knots in Dublin Bay. Wow, that's that's not a bad breeze at all. That's the gust. 12 knots average. So nice. So anybody who wants to go out practicing their ICC next weekend should be okay. Um, that is the same day um, as next weekend, I think. Yeah, it is. I should have put a date on it. But again, it shows you the same thing. You've got this uh, northwesterly wind coming in off the, off, the, off the high pressure over here. And uh, that's, that's just another picture from, that's windy.com. Now, of all the websites I use, Windy is probably the most useful. And I'll, I might be able to show you that in a minute. Now, XC Weather is another excellent uh, website for looking at weather. And this is for Dublin next weekend. So again, let's see what they say. Well, they're going for the northerly wind, like west, northwesterly wind. They're not going for 18 knots. They're going more like 10 miles an hour. Now, this is where, this is where the differences occur. You know, uh, I said to you, you know, you look at one, you look at another, and they don't agree with each other. But they broadly agree. For a start, look at that pressure. 1,035. Well, that, that means we have high pressure. High pressure generally brings good weather. The, we the rain is very, very light, if at all. The temperature at 8 degrees is quite nice for this time of year. And the wind direction agrees. What it doesn't agree with is the, is the speed. Now, so obviously... It's going to be somewhere between 7 and 18 miles an hour then. But, it, it, you know, fine. That's okay. What about the 29th um, there? That's not quite so good, is it? That's going in for, you can see that the high pressure is declining on the right-hand side. And the wind speeds are now up to the westerly, up to 33 miles an hour. That's what XC weather says. But you can look at other ones as well and um, make your own mind up about them, you know. There are... On, on the page I will give you as a, as a handout, there are 12 or 15 weather sites that you can look at. And each one will give you a slightly different image. But I always recommend starting with, uh, with, with, with Windy or XC Weather. They're, they're very good as, a, as an overview. Now that says thanks. And I'm going to now try and show you, if I can, uh, Windy. Um, and it's, it should come up. I didn't spell it right, that's why. Now, can we, can we see that image? Just let me know somebody. No, John, um, you're still sharing your slideshow Okay, I'm going to have to go back to my Zoom here. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I got it now. Yeah, I know it's wrong. Okay. I've lost, I've lost my, um... oh, I think I know what's happened. Right. You have it now, John. Yeah, yeah, I'm back now, yeah. What happened was, yeah, I got it, yeah. When the slideshow finished, it seemed to, um, now, let's see if we can get Windy up now. Can we see that now? Yeah, we can. Okay, okay, okay. that's good. So what we have, what we have, and I hope you can see the whole thing. Uh, you might have some images on your right-hand side. If you can get rid of those images in the top right, which have, you can see all the... The thing about Windy is, it, it's an extraordinary thing. It goes out for start, it goes out 10 days, which is uh, pretty good these days. Not many websites go out 10 days. This one does. So we were looking a minute ago at Saturday next week. And... Um, that's Saturday next week. So here we have um, the wind image. If I click on Dublin, like that, it, it's, no. <laughs> it's meant to give me a little, little, there we have it now, yeah. You see the way it gives me north 11 knots uh, in Dublin, right? Now that's uh, 1200 hours on Saturday. 
let's go to 1200 hours on Sunday. And we see that the, the big bad weather is indeed coming in. We can see that there. And the, it's gone to 13 knots. Now, we can see these ores high down here trying to get in, which is good. But I wonder, would it succeed? Let's have a look. Let's go to Monday. Wow, see, it's succeeding. Now, this is what I'm talking about. This is, we're not looking at anybody's forecasts here. We're doing our own forecasting. We're looking at that. We're saying, wow, Tuesday, Monday looks really good. Northwesterly wind, eight degrees in Dublin. Um, move that around a bit. Yeah, 10, 10 knots, eight degrees. And that looks to me like that ridge is going to keep building up. So there we have it. There's Tuesday. Now it's sliding down in towards St. Helia, down into the Bay of Biscay. Lovely day for crossing the bay, by the way. But you can see we're still in good weather in Dublin. But unfortunately, just off our left-hand side, we got that nasty old low. And if we go to the next day, well, the ridge is back to us. See the ridge bulging up. So we're just escaping from the bad weather. And then we go to Thursday. And we can see another big bad low up there, but it's not coming near us. The high off France is keeping us reasonably safe. So we're in for a week of good weather. I mean, you can see this on the chart. Now there's Friday and there's a definite nasty front off the West Coast. So if you're in Galway on that particular day, I think it's bad news. And let's just move that across. 33 knots. And if I change that to gusts, 45 knots. So there we have it. There's next Sunday. And you can see how I can move everything around here quite nicely. But what you have on Windy on the right hand side, and this is something I really want to point out to you, is you've got all these different options. So I've got wind, wind gusts, rain and thunder, uh, temperature, uh, more layers. Now look at this. This is amazing. You've got uh, Dew point, which we talked about a minute ago. You've got um, solar power in kilowatts. How about that? You've got the UV index. You've got your clouds. You've got your high clouds and your low clouds and your medium clouds. I mean, it is an extraordinary. You have fog. This is one that's very rarely to be found on. Um, so Windy has an extraordinary range of, uh, of features like that. John, is this a pro version? No, this is just the ordinary one. Okay. Yeah. And you can, of course, go right out across the whole world, you know, like that. I mean, it is an amazing thing. And it's free. And, and you don't get a lot more for the pro version, actually, either. So I just wanted to show you that one um, as, as a, an example of... So I'm looking at the time. It's 25 to 9. Um, don't just be looking at people's forecasts. Look at the synoptic charts. BBC Synoptic, the Met Air and Synoptic, the Windy Synoptic, they're all there. Have a look at it yourself. Make your own mind up. Think what, see what you think is going to happen. Then go looking at the other and say, oh, there's a load of crap. I don't believe that at all. And then at least if it disagrees with you, find out why. There has to be a reason why it's not right. And very often you'll, you, your interpretation of a synoptic chart will be as good or better than theirs. Because the synoptic charts don't lie. They really don't. They're incredibly accurate. So I'm going to stop there because I, I see the time and we have 25 minutes left or 20 minutes left. And we usually have time for questions and answers, but I will pop up the, um, I will pop up the, the, I'll do it now. I'll get it right away while I'm, doing, while I'm talking. I want to get the weather channel here. Um, and I want to put it up as a link so you can um, copy the link. Yeah. We have... Right. Okay. I'm going to put it on the chat because a lot of you came in late. Not late, just came in a bit later. Chat. And there is the link to the weather channel, what we call the weather channel. And we have 100 people on that. And on that, you can ask any question. You can pop in information. You can tell us what's happening where you are, which is very helpful to us. Very helpful, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so there you are. Let's have a few questions then about the weather. Just see if we can finish off. Great talk, John. Very informative. Thank you very much. Yeah, we can only scratch it. You know, it's just so much. If you went into too much detail on any one thing, you'd be, you'd get buried in it very quickly. But it, the idea was to show the main influences on Ireland and why we do have four, four seasons in one day. You know, we are uniquely placed, really. For, for, but I, did, the, the, I didn't make this point, and I'd like to. Um, there's a thing called Barry's Ballot's Law. 
B-U-Y-S, he was Dutch. And it says, if you stand with your back to the wind, low pressure is on your left. So just imagine you turn, turn your body till the wind is on your back, put your left arm out like that, and that's where low pressure is. And it works. It's an amazing uh, pointer for where, where is my nearest low pressure? And so take an example of being in the Irish Sea. The wind has gone to the south. You put your back to the wind, your back is facing south. See out your left arm and low pressure is over, is over the Atlantic, you know. So Bayes Ballot's Law, a really good one to remember. Um, no, that was the only one I wanted to mention there. Just this one I-, I John, I, um, yeah. John Leslie O'Hori here, fantastic uh, lecture as, as usual. And, and uh, I always learn something something new. Just to remind me, the, the terms uh, soon and imminent, um, if you could address that in terms of the the actual number of hours or whatever, and and does RTE and B BBC do they have the same value on that? They do. Um, so you you've got four terms, and I, I might be out by an hour or two on them, but I I know them pretty well because I've used them myself uh, in anger to get from A to B. So, for example, I was in Bangor, and the forecast to go to Troon was uh, force eight to nine later uh and i thought and my crew said oh well we'll, we'll go up the pub <laughs> i said no we're not we're going to trim and he said you can't it's four eight to nine i said no later later more than 12 hours we've got loads of time we'll be in true we'll be in true before the storm hits us okay. so we, so here it's a very good question so imminent is in the next three hours um soon is in the next six hours um i can't later is after 12 hours and I think there's another one in the middle I've missed, I've missed. But you can get them. All these all these meteorological decodes are available on MetAaron's website. But so soon is is like imminent is is is, is now. You know you, you you're staying in you're staying in harbour. Soon is in the next. I think it's the next six. Um, later is definitely after twelve, and they don't usually go beyond twenty four. You know that's the out what we call the outlook. Okay. But look, look up those yourself. But that's roughly what the, 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 the bands are. And they're very important because later is usually in the Irish Sea enough to get to Honeyhead uh, or to get to across from Scotland to Ireland, you know. So when I hear Force 8 later, well, well a good example would be um, Malin, Hebrides, Force 2 to 3, increasing Force 5, force, Storm Force 10 later. I'm, I'm off. Especially if it's southwest, which it was. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going the right way. And we went in behind gear and the, and the storm came through that night and we anchored in, we tucked into the anchorage in gear and then the storm went through. So th these terms are all really important. They, they all have a meaning. John, can I ask you, um, that was a great talk as always. Uh, Met Aaron have been criticised a number of times for their weather warnings the status yellow status orange status red some people say that met air and tend to err on the side of being overly cautious um they often issue small craft warnings what would you consider is a small craft in those weather warnings yeah the small craft warning is very specific actually and it's it's, it's as follows it's it's more than four six and a, a sea of more than three meters now there's a good reason for that. Um, any boat can be capsized in a breaking wave by a wave equal to its beam. So if you have a three meter beamy boat, right, like say classic, say 1960s boat, typical three meter beam, um, maybe the modern ones tend to be beamier, don't they? But take a three meter beam just for the point uh, and you get four six, you, you're gonna start getting waves breaking so that's why it becomes a small, a small craft warning. You're getting into breaking seas, and a breaking sea can capsize a boat when it's when the when the beam of the boat is less than the, the wave of the, the wave height. So that's where they get the small craft warning from. Now a gale warning is when it goes above four eight and four meters, and and after that all bets are off, as you know. I mean we don't we don't go there um, because it gets into into but but in fact. Everybody on the screen pretty much has a boat, which is RCD category A. Like a Beneteau, a Jano, a Bavaria, you name them. They're all category A, which is the way the EU 
oversell their boats in terms of seaworthiness because they're not really Category A boats at all. Would you really want to be out in a Bavaria 36 or Jano 36 in a Force 9? And the answer is no, you wouldn't. Not really. Mm -hmm. You might get stuck in one. You might be caught in one. And the boat is certified for it. But you wouldn't really want to be in it. Whereas if you're in a Rustler 36, you wouldn't be that worried. You know, you'd be okay. Which is why they use Rustler 36s and boats like that for the round, the global round the world challenge that's on at the moment. But um, so, yeah, so a, a girl warning is force eight, uh, four meter seas and six and three meter seas. Now, of course, that only applies, Cliff, if you're in offshore waters. If you're in Dublin Bay with the Westerly and it's and it's blowing force six, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter because you're in flat water. And you won't get a breaking sea. So you always have to take the land into account to make sure this is where your own observations come in. Oh, yeah, it might be a scale. It might be a, um, a small craft warning for, for somebody on the West Coast. But for me on the East Coast, it's not. You know, so, yeah, they, you have to. Oh, if you're in Carlingford Lock, I mean, it might be relatively flat because you're in the lock, you know. So, yeah, everything they say, you have to kind of apply your local knowledge to it. But that, again, see, again, it has a specific meaning. The, these, are, these small craft warnings, and all, they, they all mean something to somebody. And it's worth becoming familiar with the terms. Good question, that one. It uh, comes up a lot, that small craft warnings. John, I, I have a different question. Um, you mentioned that the air comes up at the equator, rises at the equator, and then comes down at about 30 degrees. Yes. Um, why specifically does it come down there rather than 40 degrees or 20 degrees? Yeah, well, it, 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 it goes up and it hits the troposphere, so it can't go any higher. So it just it spreads out north and south. It has no choice. The air is pumping up at the equator and it hits the top and it, it has to go somewhere. And it goes north. As it goes north, it cools down because it's getting away from the, from the heat now. It's gonna, the source of the heat being the sun on the equator. So it starts to cool. As it cools, it descends. And descending air warms up because you may remember that the uh, temperature increases by two degrees per thousand feet as you descend. So as this air moves north and, and cools down naturally and naturally starts to fall, it actually starts, it starts to um, dry out as well because it's, it's getting into warmer and warmer and warmer air. So eventually it ends up with zero humidity and then it hits the ground at about 30 north. It could it could be sometimes a bit further north, but it it it, it's, it runs out of energy at about there. And when it hits the ground, it, it hits it with great force because it's it's come all the way from the equator, and it spreads out in two directions. Again, it can only go two ways, north or south. And the air that goes south returns to the equator as a cell, and and that's the southeast trade winds, and then it replenishes itself and goes back up again. The 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 air that comes towards us comes towards us as the southwest trades. We have a look at a tree in Kerry, it's always bent over at 45 degrees, yeah? And the southwest winds that hit us, they go up, not because of heat, because we don't have much of that. They go up because of low pressure. And they, and they, and they, and they too go back up into the sky and, and spread out again and, and return to their point of origin. So you have these cells, you have the, the equatorial cell, which is the equator. <laughs> Out. Then you have the, 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 the where, we, where we are, the, the, the temperate zone, where the air rises because of low pressure and it spreads out and, and, and then settles back again thousands of miles away. So, yeah, so the, 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 uh, the deserts of the world all lie along the 30 degree parallel. And you, you know them all well, the Gobi Desert, the Arizona Desert, the Atacama Desert, the, on, in the southern, and the, most of Australia, you know. Uh, is in these very arid zones where there's never any rain. Um, and, and if you go a bit further to where we live, 50 degrees, you're going to get, that's where you get the, that's where you get the rising air coming, coming up from the equator and rising up again. And when air rises, it cools. And when it cools, it rains. So the only difference between us and the equator is that the equator, the rain is hot. It's 35 degrees. And when it rains here, it's bloody cold. Um, does that help with that particular one? It, 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 it just runs out of energy as it goes north and falls down, you know. It has to come down somewhere. 
Um, John, thanks very much for a very interesting uh, uh, talk. I'm just wondering, uh, have you any comments about the difference between the Met Aaron forecast and the BBC forecast? Uh, I sometimes watch the BBC forecast after Newsnight or whatever because it has a very, it seems to have a very accurate radar and it also uh, has a radar motion so so that it can actually show what where the rain is coming in relation to different parts of Ireland as well as the UK. Um, and whereas with the Met Aaron forecast after the news, uh, it has a, seems to have a lot of detail as to what's happening throughout the night, but not so accurate or, or detailed for the next couple of days. And I'm just wondering uh, about the, the difference in their, the quality of their, um, their visuals as well. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I, I watch both um, because of what I said earlier. The, the, you, you've got this thing of um, the BBC, we're lucky with the BBC in Ireland. We probably have the best weather forecasting in the world, apart from probably mm. some of the North American forecasts are pretty good. Because they have to be. They have the most atrocious weather in North America, as you know. Atrocious. But they have a huge advantage over us. They have most of their weather comes over the land and they can measure it very accurately, whereas most of our weather comes off the sea and we're relying on airplanes and ships and things like that to give us our warnings. As you know, we have the M6 boy, which lies about uh, 300 miles out in the Atlantic. You know, that's that's one of our main weather sources, you know, uh, apart from ships giving us information coming off the Atlantic. Now, there are a lot more weather boys now being deployed and all the aircraft. But getting back to your question, I would look at both. And the BBC one tends to be more accurate for the UK because they that's they're not, you know, they're not that worried about what happens in in the jolly old republic, you know, but they do they do nowadays at least have us on the map. There was a time when we weren't even on, we weren't even on the map, you know. We were just a black spot off the left. And even even recently, I've seen Northern Ireland excluded from a forecast on, on RTE. It was just blank, you know. There was no North, Northern Ireland had no weather. Uh, so politics comes into it, and there's no question about that. But yeah, I, I think probably the best answer to that was look at both and form a view, you know. The the Irish one, does, it, yeah, it does it does interest me sometimes how they seem to go into. Um, Stuff that isn't as important as you see. I, I think they're not sailors. <laughs> <That's trouble. laughs> you know, we, we we tend to want to know certain things, and I often think it's more to do with farming. You know, that they they're sort of heavily influenced towards the farmers, and they're terribly worried in RT about litigation, about not warning people of of a status. So status yellow, status orange. You know, because they got caught out a few times, and they were they were lambasted for not getting it right. And ever since then, in my view, they've gone the other way. They, everything started yellow, started orange, you know. But the thing you'll, you'll find yourself is this, that no matter what they're giving, you start us red, start us orange, doesn't matter. You go onto your synoptic chart and, and look at where you live. Like you might be living in Adrigal, um, totally sheltered from the north. You might be in Dublin Bay, a westerly wind in Dublin Bay of 4.6. They don't even reef on a, on a race day in a 4.6. In Dublin Bay, the Dublin Bay Twenty Ones go out with full sail because it's lovely. If you were racing in Galway Bay in a four six, well, you, you wouldn't. <laughs> you 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 you'd lose your boat. You know, I mean, it's the same wind, but it's a different place. You're on the west of the coast. You're in the Atlantic Ocean. You've got big waves, whereas we're totally sheltered here. And the easterly wind in Dublin Bay, conversely, conversely, force four can be a right bitch in Dublin Bay, all the way from Hollyhead, fifty miles. You know, so always. Always try and flavour what they're telling you with where do I actually live and what am I likely to see? And this is where your, your close-in forecasts come in. And one of the better ones, and I'll give it to you in a minute, it's called Predict Wind. Predict Wind is one of the newer of the ISO, of the, of the, um, the forecasts available on the internet. It has a paid version, but, but to be honest, there's not a lot more you get than the other one. Predict Wind is extremely good. Predict when can show you Dublin Bay. Um, and I'll, if I can get it, I would. Here we have it now. So this is the image that you. I will send. I'm going to, I'm going to post this on, on that um, WhatsApp group. Here we have all the different um, weather sites, and each one is a clickable link. 
So you know you've got them all there, and each of these will click you into something that's quite interesting. So you've got um, predict win. I'll just click, click it and see what happens. <laughs> I know it's lost my password, so no, I won't do it. Anyway, I'll, I'll post that on there in a minute and you can get them afterwards. So predict, just believe me, um, I'm sorry about that. Predict, believe me that PredictWind is extremely good and um, and an excellent source of weather down to, if you look at Dublin Bay on PredictWind, you will actually see a difference in wind speed between one side of the bay and the other. That's the kind of level of detail we're getting into. So I always look at these, to answer that question, to look at the yeah the the BBC and and Met Aaron, which gives you the the global overview of what you're looking at, you know they're all the, and it has the synoptic charts and all the rest of it, and 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 they you know but they won't go into you where you live. They won't tell you what's going to happen in your backyard. You can look up what's going to happen in your backyard by drilling in on Predict Wind and other such sites, which are really excellent, and and in that way you can really find out whether you can have that barbecue tomorrow or whether you can go sailing tomorrow. And uh, it makes a big difference to your life, really. Uh, I, I can't recommend enough. Become familiar. So what time are we now? One's on nine. John, do you want to take over yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, no, I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, when last year we were on our cruises, on CAI cruises, it was very interesting to have feedback where we were with the weather and all of the input you gave us, right? So it was very, it was like a course in itself. You know, every day we followed um, our website, or our uh, WhatsApp site, and people in different parts of the country fed back what they were doing. So you were able to, uh, almost like mission control, it was really helpful, you know? Yeah, it's like um, pastures planning, yes. It's um, weather routing. Um, yeah. If you have somebody, whenever you're sailing, it's quite hard when you're at sea because you don't have the internet. Once you go eight miles from shore, you know, you don't have your GPS signal, your, your, GF, you know, your telephone signal. Um, but if you have somebody at home, you can ring them and ask them to do it for you. And, and I think that's a fantastic thing to do. You can bring somebody up who, who's familiar with all this shit and they can, you know, get in there and they'll tell you exactly what's going to happen in the next 12 hours, you know. Um, I, I know one or two of us are, are putting long range, um, aren't we, John? <laughs> long range receivers so we can get the, GP, the GFS signal on your phone maybe 20 miles out or 15 miles out, you know. And uh, that works quite well. It, it's kind of a, an, an amplifier. So you can amplify your phone signal. But that's another day's work and maybe worthy of another talk, John, sometime. Um, how to. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, look, I, if there aren't any more questions, I think uh, I'd like to say on behalf of everyone present what a really interesting uh, talk this was to kick off the year again. And thank you so much, John, on behalf of everyone here, both the CAI members and those who or not necessarily see I remember, but are all weather enthusiasts. So thank you so much. Yes, John, and, and I can't I can't recommend highly enough the um the, 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 the join that WhatsApp group and you find, you know, it's it's a great resource and, and the more people join it, the better it becomes because we get more information, you know. It's good. Okay, well thank you very much and uh, look forward to the next session and the recording to refresh ourselves. Thanks so much. Yeah Pat okay, you can take good night, everyone.